Greetings, and welcome back to the channel. After some groundbreaking films in 1936, the science fiction films of 1937 are not as well remembered today. These films blend elements of action, adventure, and mystery with subtle nods to futuristic themes, almost barely their elements of the genre, creating a distinct approach with varying degrees of success but ultimately falling short, especially in its storytelling. Each is set in the present-day world of the time. No wild costumes, aliens, or robots. There are more gangsters than futuristic tech. So these are almost blink-and-you-miss-it sci-fi, except for one short film. But we do get another opportunity to see Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi, though not together in the same film. Before discussing the live-action science fiction films of 1937, I want to highlight one animated short film from Walt Disney and United Artist. This was one of the last Disney short films distributed by United Artist before moving to RKO. It speaks to how modern conveniences could impact society and can easily overwhelm the common man, or in this case, a duck. Modern Inventions is an eight-minute short directed by Jack King and written by Carl Barks. Both King and Barks had extensive careers in animation, with King working on Disney films, Looney Tunes, and Merry Melodies, and Barks, the writer of early Donald Duck stories, as well as the creator of Scrooge McDuck. In this short, Donald Duck takes a trip to a museum of modern marvels packed with cool gadgets and modern inventions. But he has a hard time figuring out how to use them. He's followed around by a polite robot butler who is constantly asking for his hat. Your hat, sir. Each time, this annoys Donald all the more and creates a cute running gag throughout the short. Donald fumbles with the machines leading to misadventures. This was my favorite of the films I watched for this episode. It was nice to see something lighthearted. The influence of this short film extends to the creators of Futurama. The suicide booths were inspired by Donald's mishaps. Modern Inventions is available on DVD collections like the Walt Disney Treasures, as well as on YouTube and the Internet Archive and I'll link them in the description below. Before continuing with the films of 1937, if you are enjoying the content, please give the video a thumbs up and subscribe for more History of Sci-Fi episodes. I've also started a Patreon, which I'll link in the description below. Your support is what keeps this channel thriving, and I'm thankful for everyone stopping by and sharing the love for this amazing genre. Now back to the live-action sci-fi of 1937. The first is Night Key, a Boris Karloff film that is more of a gangster crime drama with a sci-fi MacGuffin. This Universal Pictures production was a film few directors wanted. Actor Lloyd Corrigan, in only his fourth film as director, helmed the film after three other directors backed out. Karloff is joined by Warren Hall, and Flash Gordon's Jean Rogers as Karloff's daughter. The plot revolves around David Mallory, an inventor played by Boris Karloff, who has developed an advanced burglar alarm system. Mallory is betrayed by his business partner, who steals the profits from his invention. Mallory goes on a path of revenge and deals with gangsters led by a baby-faced guy named The Kid. This is so Mallory can provide a small nest egg for his daughter before he goes completely blind. He's aided by a small-time criminal, Petty Louie, and everyone wants Mallory's gadget to help them commit crimes. This device is the only thing that makes this science fiction. Not sure if I can recommend this to anyone other than Boris Karloff, filmography completist. He elevates the film, but only slightly. 
It's not a bad film. It's just that the story isn't memorable. Petty Louie is a good sidekick, but the kid as the main gangster is laughable. I wish this film took advantage of the burglar alarm system and went with a crazier and more creative sci-fi story. Make the invention more visual to keep the audience engaged. The film was over budget and over schedule, with a final budget of $192,000. But it still seemed like a story that was better suited for a serial than as a feature. Night Key is available on DVD as well as a colorized version on the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below. Treading the line between interwoven subplots demands skillful handling to prevent the storyline from descending into muddled chaos. Nonstop New York begins on New Year's Eve 1938 when a down on her luck actress goes back to a strange man's apartment, and while in the other room, the man is murdered by a mob boss. They didn't know she was there and could serve as a witness until she escapes back to England. I'm surprised this plot point of an unmarried woman going to a stranger's apartment got by the production code rules of the time. Based on the 1936 novel Sky Steward by Ken Attawill, Nonstop New York stars Anna Lee, who we saw in 1936's The Man Who Changed His Mind. This British film is another collaboration between Lee, her husband and director Robert Stevenson, and co-star John Loder. Once Jeannie Carr, played by Anna Lee, is back in England, she realizes that an innocent man is about to be executed for the murder she witnessed. Compelled to tell the truth, she stows away aboard a state-of-the-art, futuristic transatlantic airplane that is more of a hotel than a 1930s passenger plane. The rest of the film takes place on the airplane, as a police inspector, gangsters, their henchmen, a kid who doesn't want to practice his violin, and Jeannie all cross paths, culminating in a fight for survival. The best thing about this film is the set design of the airplane. They use an actual flying boat for the plane's design, as well as a realistic scale model for filming, making you believe that these huge flying hotels existed in the 1930s. Art director Albert W. Merton added Art Deco designs, which was still popular for futuristic storytelling in the 1930s. If it wasn't for the plain set design, this would be another average thriller crime drama. There were a few passenger-sized planes making transatlantic flights at this time, and flying boats existed, but were not anywhere near this size and grandeur. The New York Times said the film was a well-staged and moderately entertaining Class B melodrama, and went on to refer to the plane as, quote, a transatlantic airplane and richly imaginative as a front cover of popular science or a Buck Rogers spaceship, unquote. It's another one of those films from this time that is just average. The script needed some work. Anna Lee is charming on screen. John Loder was a compelling leading man, and I wish he had a better script. At least the actors playing gangsters in this film are better than the ones in Nike. Nonstop New York is available on DVD as well as for free on YouTube and the Internet Archive. I'll link them in the description below. Sky Racket is the third sci-fi film in the 1930s that I've reviewed for this channel that has a plot involving a type of death ray that is built to take down airplanes carrying the mail. I've already discussed the drama Air Hawks from 1935 and the Western Ghost Patrol in 1936. Sky Racket is more of a crime drama with gangsters than science fiction. From director Sam Katzman, best known for low-budget genre films that were not very good but still made money, and written by Basil Dickey, who worked as a writer on Flash Gordon 
Anne would go on to work on Flash Gordon Conquers the Universe in 1940 and the Captain America serial in 1944. With Dickie's experience in action serials, you would think it would pay off in this film, but not so much. Starring Bruce Bennett, a former Olympic silver medalist turned actor, though he was credited in this film under the name Herman Bricks. He was the lead in the 1935 film The New Adventures of Tarzan. He's joined by Joan Barclay and Duncan Ronaldo. Ronaldo would go on to play the Cisco Kid in the 1950s. Future Oscar winner Hattie McDaniel has a small role in the beginning of the film as Jenny. The film begins with Marion, an heiress who has no interest in her fiancé, Count Barsky, and flees on her wedding day, and through a series of misadventures, finds herself hiding in a small airmail plane as it's about to take off. The airplane, piloted by a government agent who mistakes her for a gangster's girlfriend, is shot down by a death ray. They are taken prisoner and must work together to fight the criminal gang. the main villain. They always not mysteriously like that. Miss Bronson, I believe? Yes. Oh, so you're the villain. <laughs> you don't look like one. You're too polite. Now that's my idea of a real crook. Death rays were popular at the time, and this was the only aspect of this film that puts it into the sci-fi genre. It's only used in the beginning to take down the plane. It's a boring and poor attempt at drama and intrigue. The acting, especially from the leading lady, is worse than the writing. Sky Racket is available on DVD and for free on YouTube, and I'll link it in the description below. SOS Coast Guard is one of those forgettable serials with only one thing going for it. Bella Lugosi playing a mad scientist who creates a kind of gas that can disintegrate objects. This was the seventh of 66 serials made by Republic Pictures. They brought us Undersea Kingdom in 1936, the serial that desperately wanted to be the next Flash Gordon. This serial was directed by Alan James and William Whitney. James would also work on the Dick Tracy serial in 1937, and Whitney would go on to work on Dick Tracy Returns, as well as The Lone Ranger, both in 1938. What is most notable about William Whitney is that during his career, he pioneered a new style of fight choreography on film that would revolutionize the industry by breaking action down into individual shots rather than showing chaotic brawls. Quentin Tarantino would praise Whitney as one of his influences on filmmaking. Starring Ralph Bird, best known as Dick Tracy, this time playing a Coast Guard lieutenant, hell-bent on getting revenge on a mad scientist, played by Bella Lugosi. Lugosi received second billing for this serial, and oddly he is playing a character named Boroff, a name that is an obvious knockoff of Boris Karloff. The mad scientist created a disintegrating gas and wants to smuggle it to buyers aboard a ship that conveniently gets stranded on rocks and needs assistance from the Coast Guard. After a plucky reporter recognizes Boroff, he flees and murders our hero's brother. Boroff is pursued by the Coast Guard, as well as two reporters. There's a cool henchman named Thorg. Our hero eventually tracks down Boroff's hideout cave and leads a squad to confront him. The battle includes explosions from disintegrator gas bombs as they work to thwart Boroff's evil plans. This is not Bella Lugosi's best work, and he, like almost everyone else, seems to be phoning it in. The film's description makes it sound more science fiction than it really is. There's not enough use of the disintegration gas, and the gas is never really used in a way to show the power this could have on society. The 12-episode serial was turned into a 71-minute feature in 1942 with new footage featuring Lugosi. 
SOS Coast Guard is available on DVD and for free on YouTube, and I'll link it in the description below if you would like to check it out. In 1937, the first short story by Arthur C. Clarke, Travel by Wire, was published in a fanzine, Amateur Science Stories, though he wouldn't begin publishing professionally until the mid-1940s. A lifelong lover of science and science fiction, Clarke would become one of the 20th century's most notable writers. An early French sci-fi comic strip, Futuropolis, was first published in April in the weekly magazine Junior. Set in a future world that mixed the modern with the ancient, it was influenced by Metropolis, Flash Gordon, and American serials. Some popular and influential science fiction novels include Starmaker by Olaf Stabledon. This visionary work delves into the immense journey of cosmic evolution. The story follows an unnamed human narrator who leaves his body behind and sets off on a voyage across the cosmos. Along the way, he encounters various alien societies and ultimately meets the Star Maker. Galactic Patrol by E.E. E. Doc Smith Originally published as a serial in Astounding Stories magazine between 1937 and 1938, and then as a novel in 1950. This is the journey of Kimball Kinnison's rise through the ranks of the Galactic Patrol as he battles against threats to peace across the universe. Smith, considered the father of the space opera, influenced many of the sci-fi novels and films of our childhoods. Star Begotten by H.G. Wells delves into the concept that humanity may have been genetically altered by a celestial phenomenon and ask what was humanity's role in the universe. This work is considered a significant piece in Wells' later science fiction canon for its imaginative handling of philosophical and scientific ideas. In 1937, the world was gripped by escalating tensions and conflicts. These historical and cultural events shaped filmmakers and storytellers. And so, when looking at science fiction films of the time, it is important to understand what else was going on in the world. And so, for the rest of this episode, I would like to look at some historical, cultural events, and cinematic events that occurred in 1937. The Spanish Civil War continued, and on April 26, the town of Guernica was bombed by German and Italian aircraft in support of General Franco's forces. Pablo Picasso's epic painting, completed in 1937 as a response to the bombing, has emerged as an enduring symbol of anti-war sentiment and how to use art as a means of political expression. Measuring 11 and a half feet by 25 and a half feet, it portrays the horrors of war through a chaotic, Cubist-inspired composition of distorted figures and vivid brutality. Debuting at the 1937 Paris International Exposition, the painting was then shown throughout the world, bringing widespread attention to the Spanish Civil War. Picasso adamantly refused to allow the painting's return to Spain as long as Francisco Franco remained in power. Tragedy struck on the 6th of May, when the Hindenburg airship caught fire while attempting to dock in New Jersey, resulting in the deaths of 36 people and marking a grim milestone in the history of aviation. On July 2nd, Amelia Earhart, while trying to become the first female pilot to circumnavigate the globe, disappeared in the Pacific. Despite extensive search efforts, the plane carrying Earhart and navigator Fred Noonan were never found leading to an enduring mystery about their fate. The Second Sino-Japanese War erupted in July as Japan invaded China, marking the beginning of a brutal conflict that would eventually merge into World War II. The conflict ravaged China, leading to widespread devastation and loss of life, and drew international attention as nations grappled with how to respond 
to Japan's aggression. The Nanjing Massacre, also known as the Rape of Nanking, began on December 13th and lasted for six weeks after the Japanese army unleashed a campaign of mass murder, rape, and destruction, leading to the death of an untold number of civilians. And like I've said in most episodes covering the 1930s, not everything is doom and gloom. Some exciting and some controversial things happened in the world of art, comics, radio, and literature. And now, the guiding light. On January 25th, the radio show The Guiding Light premiered. In 1952, it would move to television and become one of the most popular and long-running soap operas ever. The first issue of Detective Comics from DC was published in March of this year, but it was issue number 27 published in 1939 that would become one of the most famous in all of comics, with the introduction of Batman. From July to November, the Degenerate Art Exhibition was held in Munich, Germany. This Nazi propaganda event aimed at vilifying modern art and promoting Nazi ideals of racial purity and cultural superiority. The exhibition featured works by artists they deemed degenerate, including avant-garde and modernist pieces, and works by Jewish artists that were condemned as morally corrupt and culturally inferior, including works by Emil Nolde, Ernst Kirchner, Wassily Kandinsky, Mondrian, Otto Dix, Pablo Picasso, and Paul Klee. The Great German Art Exhibition, held alongside the Degenerate Art Exhibit, promoted Nazi-approved artwork and idealized portrayals of German culture, history, and mythology, aiming to promote Nazi aesthetics and propaganda. In literature, Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck tells the story of two ranch workers during the Great Depression, while exploring the meaning of friendship and struggle for survival in an unforgiving world. This year marked the publication of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit, which invited us into the world of Middle-earth through the eyes of a hobbit named Bilbo. The novella quickly captivated readers with imaginative world-building that still speaks to us today. Nineteen thirty seven saw the release of the first full length American animated feature, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, from supervising director David Hand and produced by Walt Disney. Its innovative use of color and storytelling raised the bar, paving the way for a series of cherished animated classics still watched today. In technical achievements, the Aeroflex thirty five. The first reflex 35mm camera was introduced. This revolutionary camera changed filmmaking. Using a spinning butterfly shutter and a viewfinder to show what was being recorded. Designed for handheld newsreel filmmaking, it would be used by American troops during World War II and footage captured during the war was used in the Nuremberg trials. Later models of the camera would be used by filmmakers of the French New Wave, as well as by Stanley Kubrick and George Lucas. Sadly, Jean Harlow passed away on June 7th at the age of 26 due to kidney failure. Her unexpected death shocked the film industry, marking the end of a promising career and leaving an indelible mark on Hollywood's golden age. She's remembered for her films Hell's Angels, Dinner at Eight, Bombshell, and Libeled Lady. Harlow was filming the romantic comedy Saratoga with co-star Clark Gable when she fell ill on set. The completed film was released six weeks after her death and was a modest hit for MGM. On July 9th, a fire erupted at the 20th Century Fox Vaults in New Jersey destroying 40,000 highly flammable silver nitrate negatives from the silent film era. The fire, which destroyed valuable film reels and historic artifacts, 
dealt a significant blow to the preservation of early cinema history and underscored the importance of film preservation efforts. The Academy Awards for films released in 1937 celebrated the film The Life of Emile Zola as Best Picture, Leo McCary as Best Director for The Awful Truth, Spencer Tracy for Best Actor for Captain's Courageous, and Louise Rayner made history winning back-to-back Best Actress Oscars in 1936 and 1937, this time for The Good Earth. W. Howard Green won an honorary Oscar for Color Photography for A Star is Born. And once again, there were no nominations for science fiction films. The popular comic strip character Dick Tracy made his big screen debut in a 15-episode serial. Starring Ralph Bird, who worked alongside Bella Lugosi in this year's sci-fi serial, SOS Coast Guard. The famous detective's enduring appeal is evident in various merchandise, video games, and other adaptations. Some of the notable non-science fiction films of 1937 include The Grand Illusion, a French war film directed by Jean Renoir. Set during World War I, the film follows a group of French prisoners of war as they plan their escape. The film looks at ideas that go beyond class, nationality, and the futility of war, earning critical acclaim as one of the greatest films ever made. The Good Earth, based on Pearl S. Buck's celebrated novel, was directed by Sidney Franklin and follows the challenges of a Chinese farming family facing societal changes and environmental obstacles. However, the film starring Paul Muni and Louise Rayner received mixed reviews. Initially intending to cast Chinese actors, MGM eventually chose a predominantly white cast due to production code constraints that prohibited interracial on-screen couples and concerns about audience reception. Despite controversy over the casting, Rainer's performance earned her the Academy Award for Best Actress. A Star is Born This Technicolor film, directed by William A. Wellman, stars Janet Gaynor and Frederick March in a story of ambition, fame, and the sacrifices required for success. It became the first color film to be nominated for Best Picture. Based on the 1932 film What Price Hollywood, it would be remade in 1954, 1976, and 2018. And though not popular at the time, Shh, The Octopus is now a cult classic. This comedy horror film was directed by William McGann. Set in a remote lighthouse, the story follows a group of characters who encounter bizarre occurrences. The film is known for its shocking in-camera transformation scene where an alleged harmless old lady is revealed to be the villainous octopus. This transformation was achieved through the clever use of makeup and color filters, shocking audiences at the time. 1937 was a difficult year for some aspects of filmmaking. From a lack of creativity in science fiction films, to the loss of 20th Century Foxes, silent film collection in a fire, but we also saw new camera technology, and Technicolor was making significant strides in the industry. An emerging writer began his career, though not as a professional just yet. Arthur C. Clarke would soon change science fiction. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more history of sci-fi content, and I'll see you in 1938.